Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Come on in. I am so glad that you're here with me, as always, every week. I appreciate those of you who have been commenting and liking my social media posts. Keep that coming. We want to interact with you. Don't forget, we're going to have a group meetup on Zoom, our very first one, which is coming up on June 25th. That's a Saturday. It will be 10 a.m. Arizona time. So you can Google what time that would be in your time zone. But I do need you to register for this event so I know how many to expect. And the registration link is in the show notes. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be casual, just getting to know each other. And I want to meet you and find out what you like about the show, where you live, and your pets, what topics you want to hear about next. All going to be casual, just getting to know one another. Yes, you can invite a friend if you want. It's for all those that are listeners of the podcast and supporters of DSW Ministries, my music. So we are going to have these meetups every month, and it will be the last Saturday of each month at the same time. So we can plan that. So if you miss this one, be sure to register anyway if you're not going to be at this first one because it will remind you that our meeting is coming up. Otherwise, it's it's going to be really difficult for me if you're not on my mailing list to let you know that our meeting is coming up. So I hope to see everyone there. Now, today's show comes with a trigger warning because my guest story is pretty rough. We've had a lot of survivors on the show, and we've had some pretty horrific stories. And we're not minimizing anybody's experience or anybody's abuse. No two abuse histories are the same. You've heard some of my story, which we haven't finished that series yet. I plan on doing that soon and finish my story. My story is very different from maybe your story or my guests, but we can talk about what we have in common, the lessons we've learned, and how to help somebody else. We can maybe learn coping strategies or ways to heal. So as always, that is my goal on this podcast, not just to have people on the show to talk to, about abuse, but we want to help you heal from it. If you're still in the middle of it, we want to help you get out of that. And so back to our guest today, we're going to try and keep it as non-graphic as possible. I've listened to her on a couple of other podcasts, and um, I'm telling you, I was affected by her story. And she reached out to me last week to be on the show, and I am thrilled to have her on the show. We have a lot of things in common. We do a lot of the same things. Her name is Victoria Cure, and I'd like to read her bio for you here. I am a survivor and a mother of a special needs miracle child. With more than 16 years of educating myself, and countless others within the special needs community, I bring light to those who've known true darkness. I have dedicated a large portion of my life to aiding those who are not in a position to help themselves. I have several degrees and certifications, which also include a paralegal degree, ASL Masters, First Aid, AED, CPR, 
tracheostomy certification, two black belts in mixed martial arts, and I am currently furthering my studies through online classes at Yale. I also speak to groups of domestic violence survivors as well as advocate for both survivors as well as special needs families. I am an accomplished author and work throughout the year to bring awareness along with toys for the special needs communities. My daughter and I have been featured on TV advocating for those with challenging abilities and also with abused women. Having become a survivor has made me into a pit bull. I advocate for these families and individuals and fight tooth and nail for them. So that's Victoria's bio, and we are going to talk about many different topics today. We might turn it into two parts series because I have a lot of questions on my list. <laughs> And she's a wonderful lady, very charismatic and positive, and you're definitely going to want to listen to this one. So without further ado, here is Victoria Cure. All right, please welcome Victoria Cure to the show today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to say we have the bionic woman on the show now, I mean, seriously, how do you go through metal detectors or fly on an airplane? <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. Um, I actually have different cards that I can present and say here, like when we did my daughter's make a wish, I have a bunch of cards that says I have a titanium shoulder. I have a metal face. I have this, I have that. And they have to take me to the side. I can't go through it, which is fantastic because I'm- You've been to that so machine that they x-ray your whole body and stuff? No, they do the wand. Oh, they, they only do the wand. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been through the other. They just always do the wand. Um, when I've gone to court and I had to have metal, um, I haven't been in the courtroom since way before COVID, but they literally were like, oh, um, here. And they're like, you look so harmless. And they're like, okay, just go on in and go around. And I'm like, <laughs> you just kind of walk on over and walk around, but they normally wand you. So y'all that are under 40 who do not know who the Bionic Woman is, that was a TV show back in the 70s, 80s-ish. and Think and, of the Terminator. Well, it's nicer than the Terminator. She was an actual human being. Yeah, for reference. And just like the Bionic Man, Steve Austin, he was an astronaut and he got in a crash and they, instead of him dying, they, they made him his legs and his one arm and his eye was replaced with with a machine and you get the the slow-mo do, 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 do. you know he's running <laughs> i'm really dating myself here <laughs> nah, the roku thing you can see all those episodes yeah so, so you know <laughs> you're not saying nothing <laughs> That's, i mean people don't even know what, what happy days is the young people because uh, my last name is Winkler, and so whenever they ask, you know, your last name, it's it's Winkler, like the Fonz. Fonz. And they look at me like, who's the Fonz? Mm -mm. <laughs> like, okay, you've never seen Happy Days? Mm -mm. Henry Winkler? Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 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 I love, love those great shows, but... Um, I also hear that you can back into any space with any vehicle one-handed. I can. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I am challenged in that department. I am partially paralyzed in my left hand, and my hand is um, screws and pins and plates, and I can back a vehicle one-handed no matter what. I've backed trucks, vans, cars, whatever. Yeah. Pretty impressed. <laughs> Even going forward, I'm like, I park crooked. And my husband's very good at parking. And I even lived back east where I um you know I you were you were forced to parallel park. And Ugh. yeah, that's that's a nightmare. The whole neighborhood comes out and turn the turn to the right. Now straighten the wheel. Now go back and tell them the fawns taught you. <laughs> yeah. And just smack the, the, the dashboard and, and the car goes into place. Um, very, very affected by your story. I've been listening to 
Uh, so thanks for reaching out to be on the podcast. I've already given people a trigger warning. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've had some we've had some guests on the show that have had some tough stories to um, to listen to, but but the ending is is very positive and powerful and empowering, and so I've encouraged people to push through and listen to the whole episode. And we're gonna jump into probably the beginning when you were raised by your your grandparents. So like, what was your childhood like? Um, I, I call my biological parents, my sperm and egg daughter. I appreciate everything they didn't teach me, uh, because it taught me how I did not want my footprint to be. Um, I had all of my influence given to me by my grandparents. They were very old school, um, very gentlemanlike. Like I watched him always, I watched my grandfather always open the door for my grandmother and look at my beautiful bride. He would order for her and, you know, that very old-fashioned care for the wife and then she cooked the meals and the men couldn't be in the kitchen because that's how you showed your love and and it was just so amazing I always watched him hold hands and he would kiss her forehead and those are the things I was like oh I want that you know and Aww. I and it was beautiful it was so beautiful to watch and, and then I would go back to my parents quote unquote house and it was the complete opposite it was the absolute opposite where I've never to this day heard my biological father tell his wife that he loves her and it was so unbelievably different and i took the values that my grandparents had and instilled them and in who i want to be as a wife and a mother and an individual today because it's so unbelievably different like i live for my family i live for helping other people where my biological family my biological parents um i have no contact with they literally disowned my daughter who has special needs they don't want anything to do with her they don't want anything to do with me um they i'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist but they present all the symptoms that you would find in very serious narcissistic behavior um that's what all my decades of counseling have taught me um and that is just it's more about who they are and the opinion that everybody else has about them and they're totally different people behind closed doors and that's not i would rather have all the love in the world than all the money and it's the opposite for them so that is kind of all that packaged up i guess as in being narcissists i mean what was their their problem they didn't want to raise children <laughs> um it, I, I don't, I don't really know. She married my dad and she already had another child. And then there was a good bit of time between me and my brother. And there is not one child that has a relationship with both parents. Um, her son, who is my brother, and I don't have contact because of how they are. And it's, she does everything for him. She enables everything for him. Like she makes all of his own bank deposits. He doesn't know how to make a bank deposit. Um, she gets groceries for him. Uh, he goes over to their house and picks up their dog and takes their little poodle sized dog for visitation on like his two days off and takes the dog like a drive through window. He drives up, she goes outside, gives the dog to him through the window and then out they go. And, you know, it's mind blowing to me and everything like she lives and breathes for her son. It was a complete opposite. Uh, she goes on, she used to go on vacation with him every year. They'd stay in the same room. They would go on a cruise. They stay in the same room. They took a couple pictures together. Like I was like, I was adopted. I was left at a fire station. Something happened because I have nothing in common with them. Like nothing. And mm. it blows my mind. Um, he came out as homosexual. I did say to him at one point that as long as the person you're with treats you right and doesn't put their hands on you in an unwarranted way, and you're happy, okay. And he, you know, his, our dad cannot stand the fact that he's homosexual. He hates the fact he's homosexual. He won't let his boyfriend come over to the house. My older half sister's not allowed at the house. I'm not allowed at the house. Um, he doesn't have anything to do with any of the grandkids at all, nothing anymore. Um, it's just, it's a horrible thing. And it's hurtful for me because I'm not like them. I can't just let it go like they do. I can't just be like, whatever. And that's the problem is because if, and you know, my counselor said the same thing to me. She said, if you 
didn't let that bother you, you would be just like them. But because of who you are, yeah, it's painful because you strive and thrive to have that acceptance from them that you don't have. You know, it's never enough. And um, it, it, it was just unacceptable. And I'm so much happier now. My daughter is happy. And, and I'm very thankful. I mean, they took me in um, when I needed to be somewhere and I'm forever grateful for them for that. I, I just don't have the same values and outlooks, I guess, that they do. Mm, okay. Well, it sounds like you had wonderful grandparents. Yes. Who raised you. And so let's hear about how you met your one true love. Which, spoiler alert, is is your current husband. There's a whole, yeah, that's, that's a spoiler alert. I had, had always been told, you know, when you meet the one by my grandparents. And I thought that was just ludicrous. Like, you know, that had to be an old wise tale. Well, I met him, if you want, I don't like the term hazing because it's just not something you affiliate with. I did with, he had just graduated the police academy and, um, he had just finished his FTO training. And so I was friends with his FTO officer and a couple of his other officer friends. And they had asked him to come meet up with them. And I was there and, and he gets out of the vehicle. And like I, I said to you before we recorded, I didn't even notice him in his uniform. Like it wasn't the uniform. I got glued to the, this man's face. It was all about his face. And he walks up and he's like, Hey, what's going on guys? Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, she wanted to talk to you. And I'm standing there and and here I am, this corporate person. I'm very well articulate. I can hold a conversation. And I'm like, huh? Just I'm like, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm yeah, right. I'm like, what? And I said, you wrote me a, um, a citation. And, and then everybody behind him's like, no. And I was like, um, a t- <laughs> you wrote me a ticket? And then, yeah, they're all back there, you know, with the hand across the, no. And um, he's like, well, where did I write it? And I'm like, huh? And he goes, where, where did I write you a ticket at? And I, uh, and one of the officers behind him is pointing to the road, you know, back behind us. And I was like, uh, there? And he's like, I would have never given you a ticket. And I was like, you did? And I knew, I knew at that moment he was it and I was done. And I called my best friend who I've been best friends with since preschool. And I was like, I'm done. It's over. I found him. I'm done. And she was like, no way. Yep. We were together for four years and we broke up and only time I'd ever had a broken heart in my entire life. Yep. Why did you break up? I don't understand. Um, it, it wasn't, I'll choke it up to it wasn't the right timing. We'll just say that. Okay. It wasn't the right timing, but it was the like, most amazing four years, but it, it wasn't the right timing. And it was like the hardest thing at, at that point in my life I'd ever been through because I didn't know what heartache was until then. Yeah, I can understand that. We'll we'll hear more about him later on in your story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're you were on the rebound and that's a really dangerous place for people to be. Yes. I had never rebounded with anyone ever. And I rebounded with can I call him just the monster? Can I rebounded sure. with the monster. Ooh. That fits. Um, yeah. And my ex met him and you have never seen two people hate each other nuclearly like these two my ex and i stayed friends and when i told him i was seeing someone he was like you're miserable it's an all over your face like you don't like this guy you know whatever and um he met him and the, oh they just no Mm-mm. they were never going to get along and so yeah i rebounded with the monster I think we've we've all been on those that rebound after a relationship. I've I've done it myself. That's that's probably how I got suckered into my ex husband too. Is I just I was engaged to somebody else and jumped right into another relationship. Uh, you're you're really vulnerable and needy and want to fill that void, but that sets you up for some really bad stuff and so you met you met the monster and what kind of uh, behaviors was he exhibiting red flags 
so charismatic, so charming, so devoted. Um, it was like, he was so proud of me everywhere we went. Like, he was just like, look at this beautiful woman I'm seeing. Um, he knew that I wanted a family. He knew how bad I wanted to be a mom. And he knew that that was like the little part of me that was missing. Um, and so he played on that and he did it well. Um, I didn't live with him until we were married. Uh, I had my own apartment. I was traveling for work. And he literally, you know, was like, we just all of a sudden out of nowhere. And, he, you know, I'm sure you could probably attest to this. It was, we need to get married. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, hey, breaks, you know, yeah. you know what yeah. is you're just going way too fast. And it was like, haven't we spent enough time apart from each other? And now that we have the ability to have that happiness, why put it off any longer? Um, he would go so far as to pull the card like, you know, all I've ever done is help other kids. And, you know, I grew up with all these foster siblings and, and I just want to help others. And I want us to have our own family. And, you know, with my background in the military and always being deployed, you know, to come home and have a family is all I've ever wanted, you know, my own family. And then I'm like, man, I'm a schmuck, you know? And I'm like, why am I feeling so wrong? Because I want him to slow down. And I'm telling him if it's right, it'll be right in six months, you know? And he's like, we've been away from each other long enough and, you know, now we're together. So why can't we start, you know, our lives together as one. And then, you know, I would feel like I'm this tiny little person for being so selfish. And he would remind me that he hadn't done anything to me to make me that way to him where I would want to put the brakes on because what has he done? And then it made me feel even worse. You know, why am I trying to like hold it off? You know, and then it really, it goes and plays with your head. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it does. And then, you know, he's like, you're always traveling for work and then I don't get to see you very much. And, you know, I want to be able to have you to come home to, you know, when you get done traveling or when I'm, you know, overseas or whatever to have you at home, I want to be able to take care of you. I want to give you that family you've always wanted. And I would feel like I'm the biggest jerk because I am taking out on him the fact that I have this insecurity because my heart was broken. And I mean, I'm the person that really believes that your attractiveness comes from within Mm -hmm. and that you could have the best soul and the, you know, just be a good hearted person. And to me, I become insanely attracted to you, but he physically was not attractive. And I just, when he would do that, it would just make me feel even worse. And then you know, he would tell me these horrific stories about him being deployed and some of the things that happened to him. Um, there were scars, not, he didn't have a lot of scars. He only had a few. And he would tell me how he got these scars in battle and it broke my heart. I mean, just to hear what he would go through, you know, and he's like, and then I come home to an empty home and it's not a home. It's a house. Cause there's nobody here. And, you know, I mean, it was just like, wow. It's a lot of manipulation going on right there. It is. And it that's is. a red flag for anybody listening, anybody that's trying to rush you into a relationship like a marriage. Now, my background, I had a church community that pushes people to get married. And in the military, it sounds like the military, you know, I've heard people, they, they'd get married so they could get the benefits because they're a military spouse. But I don't think you should be pushed into a a relationship, especially marriage. Right. And see, I didn't know anything about military benefits. Right. I've never been with anyone in the military. It's not like, you know, I had this knowledge of what it was going to be like. Yeah. So he, he rushed it on our wedding day. Um, I'm going to show my age there. Happy days. I uh, literally sat there on the floor with my Palm Pilot. <laughs> and I was looking at flights back because I knew it wasn't the one I knew he wasn't the one and I was looking at airfare back I even called my assistant and I'm like um I uh yeah I need to know but so I mean I sat there for a long time and something came over me that something amazing would come out of this and I had no idea what it was it was just an overwhelming powerful like I can't even begin to explain it. It was just as clear as can be. So I got up and I got married. You just went through with it? Just I did. Jumped in. I, I did. 
Now I had the dog show wedding. And so it was like, you know, my name's on the tea towels thing. And (laughs) I would have canceled that wedding. It would have been like a lot of fallout. But looking back, I wish I would have, I wish I would have just said, nope, I too many red flags. I don't think, I don't think we should get married, but we're, when we're 20 years old and we don't know any better, right? And we're not told or taught about the red flags. Nobody told us about it. Well, my, my, my mother and my sister, they, they saw the red flags, but I didn't listen. Told, I was not told. So I, you know, I just thought, man, this guy's so charming and he cares about, you know, children so much. And, and it's just, he's had a hard, rough time at life and, you know, and unbelievably good at what he did. I mean, you thought, did you think that things were going to get better or, oh, you know, once we get married, things will be great? I told him on our wedding day that I wasn't in love with him. And I loved him as a person. I loved the qualities that he showed me and how, you know, he was so big hearted about kids and this is that and the other. And, you know, and he was like, well, you're not allowing, this is how good he was. He said, I'm not, you're me, meaning me. I am not allowing that wall to come down to allow myself to be in love again because of the pain I went through with my ex after being together for four years. And so I'm prohibiting the unconditional love that's standing in front of him. And that because I do love him for who he is and what he offers, that I can and will fall unbelievably and unconditionally in love with him if I would take down those walls and those barriers and see that he's offered me something that at the time my ex didn't. Mm -hmm. So screw that one around for a second. And then, you know, you're like that. Yes. See? Wow. That's, that's a different angle there. So you got married and what happened after that? We, I, I moved in with him. I had an apartment and I had to get out of my lease and all that stuff. And we got pregnant right away. It was one of the only few times we had consensual intercourse, and I mean consensual, and all I ever wanted was to be a mom, and I was so excited to be pregnant. I mean, he was still very charismatic. He was still very charming. Now, you have to realize that I didn't move in with him until after we were married. We got pregnant very quickly after that, and as soon as he realized I was pregnant, and that's when the abuse started. That's when he, he started it. Why do you think he waited until you were married to start the abuse? Because he couldn't have me. Like, I've learned that a lot of these abusers literally wait until they have an opportunity to isolate you from others, to have you under their control before you really start seeing their true colors come out. Mm -hmm. Um, Because now I'm in the middle of this, like, tiny little military area and he, you know, I, I don't know anyone in the area anymore. And it's like, I'm happy I'm pregnant, you know, and, and that's when I started to really see him. And we didn't like spend that kind of time together. We didn't travel together. We didn't do vacations together before we got married um, because of my schedule and his schedule. So we didn't get to do, you know, all that stuff. So that was another another issue so you you don't really know this man pretty much i thought i did but apparently i (laughs) oh boy so the abuse starts what what was the the first time that he did the physical stuff um he threw his cell phone at me and it hit me in the face and i literally stood there dumbfounded i know that didn't just happen like i i know that didn't just happen and then he got up in my face and he hit me. He slapped me. And I, I was just mortified. I was like, I'm not that woman. I am not that woman. And he said, well, if you'd only done what I told you to do, you wouldn't have had me to have to do this to you. You know, you mm. wouldn't have had to make me do this. And if you would just do what I say, and now look what you made me do. You made me get upset. You made me feel like I had to put you in line and I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to come up and hit my pregnant wife. And then I'm like, wait a minute. I'm still stuck back here that you freaking hit me. Yeah. Like, I'm back here. And now you're over here guilting me because you did it. Like, and he's just like, I don't want to come up and hit you. Why do you make me do these things to you? If you had just done what I asked you to do, I wouldn't have had to do it. And I'm like, 
I felt like Beetlejuice, you know, another yeah. movie. You know, you're <laughs> just kind of like, just what? And I was dumbfounded. I really was. I just could not get over what had just happened. Well, he hit you the first time. And, you know, people say this all the time that if you, if you just do what you're told or you just, you know, appease him and and meet his needs then he wouldn't hit you or he wouldn't treat you so bad that isn't true true. you could be the perfect wife and you and I have both tried to be the perfect wife and it doesn't work no I tell people all the time when I talk to to women I ask them to bring in their family and those that might be as supportive as they could be I tell them all the time I'm like you just don't understand we could do everything to the letter of their demands and then somebody cuts them off on the way home somebody gets mad at him at work. You know, he didn't get what he wanted. He wanted to go get beer at the convenience store and they were out. It doesn't matter. Something is going to conflict him and he's going to come home and take it out on us regardless. It doesn't matter. We are still his punching ground and that's the bottom line. It's not what did we do to make him mad? And that's irritating because, you know, immediately it's like you're making an assumption that you've never been in our position. Yeah, you've not been in our shoes. And you shouldn't make judgments about people, right. one, or right. their situation, and two, stop victim blaming. Yes, we're the ones who are under the, the, the light, the spotlight the whole time. We have to prove our truth. They don't have to prove their innocence. You know, it's always on us to prove it's not a he said, she said, <laughs> that what he did. I mean, so many times they get away with it. It's overlooked. It's covered up. It, that's you know, it's, it's not fair. We're victimized enough. Why are you going to keep doing it to us? Yeah. Hold them accountable. So when, when we try and walk on eggshells and try to appease them, it just gets worse. Mm -hmm. It definitely does. Cause we're feeding that we are feeding the monster. Yes. Literally. Uh, And so we're, we're going to step into uh, something else. That's a big part of your story. Those that have been listening to my show a long time know that I have been a martial artist for the last 22 years. And so the part that you you talk about that you have uh, two black belts. Yes. Two black belts. And you have all these skills. Mm-hmm. And you decided not to fight back with the physical violence. So tell us, what was the mental process in your brain that determined your your choices and your plan of action? Well, but you know, because you sparred, I'm sure, mm-hmm. that you you learn to take the, the, the sparring, basically. But what it is, is when I went through all my training, we are taught, my sensei taught me from day one, it's for de-escalation, for number one that you de-escalate the situation and get away. You never throw the first punch, you de-escalate, you defend, you get away. And so that was my mentality. And you know, you're a survivor too. And so I, I'm not trying to speak on your behalf, but I really believe my training made a huge impact on my survival because you know, you're trained so much when you're going through your sparring and your technique training and things like that, that you, can tolerate the sparring and the hitting better than your average person who does no training at all. And the, you know what I mean? Like if somebody hit us, we're kind of used to it in the sparring sense versus somebody who's never been hit before in regards to the impact of the hit. And so I was taught in all of my training that you do not, you absolutely do not hit the first punch. You, you deescalate and you get away and that's it. You self-defend. If the first hot hit comes in, you self-defend get away, get out. And that was the mentality. And when he would wake me up, straddled over me, punching me in the face to go get him some water, I knew that this was not going to be a get out quickly. This was going to be a fight or flight. Like I knew that. And I also knew if I fought back that he was going to be even more physical. I mean, he, he made it very clear that he would make me lose my child. And that became a very, very hard thing. And I own what I've done and I own what I do. And nobody is perfect. 
um, I made a deal with the devil. I told him that I would I would allow him because uh, he was going to hit me anyway, but he could not hit my stomach. He couldn't. I wanted my child to survive. And so I told him, I said, just don't hit my stomach. And I started learning his patterns, which I'm sure you did with your ex. You know, when they get really hot and heated um, with mine, I don't know about yours, but if you kind of tried to deescalate them and, and talk to them, it would just kind of like calm down all the way and then he'd get mad and walk away and like leave. Was, is that what happened with you? My situation was very different because my um, my abuser never hit me, but I was a martial artist when we were married. And uh, I told him that if he ever did try to hit me, that I would fight back. I would, may lose, uh, but I am going to die trying. Right. I, will well, not, I, didn't, I wasn't pregnant and I did not have any children. Right. Okay, so well, there's I, that caveat. <laughs> Right. Well, I told him, you know, I said to him, I will not fight you back if you do not hit my stomach. Because at this point, now I have to say one hit, one kick, one slap, whatever it is, is too many. Yes. I don't, I don't care if it's one or 200. I do care. You know what I mean? It, it's not acceptable. Do not put your hands on somebody unwarranted, period. But if he was going to hit me once, don't hit my stomach stay away from my child. That's my baby. And I was being that protective mom because he would walk up out of nowhere and just hit me. You know, yeah. you didn't put the dishes away, pop. You know, yeah. I just didn't want him to come around and hit my stomach. That was yeah. it. One of the times we went to court, he did testify that the only reason he started the abuse when I was pregnant was because he knew if he hit me when I wasn't pregnant, I wouldn't be there. And I would have fought him back and I would have hurt him. And he's right. I would yeah. not have hit him first. I absolutely would not have hit him first. But you better believe I would have stopped the threat and I would have defended myself and then I would have been gone and I would not have come back. So he knew. Right. So like the listeners know, we had my Jeet Kune Do teacher on the show here a few weeks back, uh, Kenny Ezek. So if y'all haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to it. It's very helpful. He mentioned that it would be difficult to make the choice to fight your abuser because it may be somebody you love or somebody you live with. And it depends on the situation. And nobody knows how they will react to violence in right. that situation. We can all say, like, you know, we're Wonder Woman and we would, you know, do this and we would do that. Even those of us that are trained to do so, we don't know how we're going to react because there's that the adrenaline and the stress hormones and going through the scenarios of... <laughs> Uh, I can't believe this is happening to me. Right. Now, I was never taught to wait for the first punch. I've studied seven martial arts, and my teachers, because my martial arts were, were, were not traditional ones. They were more on the practical side. They taught me, as a woman, that no jury is going to convict you for responding in a violent situation first because I'm five foot five. <laughs> I'm not very big. And every one of my teachers said, if you feel threatened, they're in your personal space. No one is, no, no court is going to convict you for defending yourself, especially if you have a child in the picture, especially if you're pregnant. Now in our state, it also depends where you live and what state you live in as far as the, the laws. In my state, if somebody puts their, their finger on your chest, that's considered assault. Right. And you can respond to that. So I don't know, you know, you're in a dis undisclosed location, so I don't know what your laws are. But um, I find that interesting that your, your teachers told you never to strike first. Now, again, it's, it's the situation. Right. I don't go to bars and I don't go and pick fights in bars, but yeah, I would de-escalate, you know, a total stranger. That's a totally different situation. Yeah, yeah. If I'm out, you know, walking in the park and somebody comes up to me and he's drunk and he's, you know, trying to force me into the bushes. I mean, yeah, I would try and de-escalate the situation with a stranger or drunk he's Uncle Harry. Put his hands on you and then you can defend yourself. So you are 
doing if he's that. in my personal space and he's verbally threatening me in my state i am allowed to i am allowed to defend myself because he's bigger and stronger than me uh we have constitutional carry in arizona anybody who hasn't been a criminal can carry a firearm that makes things a lot more complicated when we have to and this is terrible we have to think about the laws but we're being threatened and we're being molested and our abuser knows that we will fight back and they're using that against us i mean well, he's also using against me that he would keep my daughter from me like he would yeah. fight and he would either punch me in the stomach and make me lose the baby or when the baby was born he would take her from me and because he was active duty it was a different playing field altogether. Well, I hadn't been in anyone in the military, so I don't know the, these laws and how they're governed. And so I actually went to his command. And I do know that not every military base is bad. Not every military unit is bad. But one in three military families have some sort of abuse in it. And if it's one in three that is a statistic that is a factual statistic, how many are not getting reported? That That's the question. And it is covered up more than people realize. The soldiers are getting away with it. They're getting no retribution for their actions. And I kept going to them and saying, you know, I'm extremely fair skinned. I got a black eye. I have a busted nose. I have this, I have that. Yeah. And they're like, why do you keep showing us all this proof? You're not doing anything and it keeps happening. And like I said, I contemplated fighting back. I'm human. But mm -hmm. also when you wake up being beaten in the face, Mm -hmm. You think if I hit him back right now and I try and get away when I'm asleep tonight, is he going to hit me in the stomach and I lose my child? Right. There's and, all these things that go through your head. Right. And I did try at one point to leave. Um, and when I did, he shot and killed our dog to prove a point of what he would oh, do to me. That, that just. To prove a point. And now the difference me. here, isn't it? He said, she said. I have 1,000% proof of absolutely everything that happened because of how far I took this in court and how I went after the rights and things of that nature. So it's never, he said, she said, I mean, it's all documented. Oh, yeah. We've had so many people that had also documented that. But with violence in the home, it's we have to make that decision for ourselves right? Your situation was totally different than mine. And there are others that are listening that they're like, well, I would, I would rather die than be raped. And they'll make the decision that they're going to fight back. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is, that is your choice to fight back. And there are others that they want to live. They want to survive any means necessary and they will, they'll, they'll be raped or they'll get beaten such as in your case, because they want to either live themselves or they want to protect somebody else in the house. Mm -hmm. um, should survivors feel shame about not resisting in order to survive? I mean, I did say no yeah. when, when he would push himself on me and that didn't stop him. He did it anyway, you know, and then when he would get violent, and I mean, we're talking viciously violent. I have been stabbed over a dozen times. You know, I've told people that you don't have surgery for something that's not broken. I haven't had cosmetic surgery, but you know, you don't have surgery for things that aren't broken. I don't get hundreds of stitches when you haven't been stabbed. You know, doctors <laughs> and hospitals are not going to just do that. But there were times where I, I tried any and everything I could to de-escalate the situation, and even verbally, where mm -hmm. he was so angry. And I don't even know why he came home angry one day and he was just vicious and I thought oh no this is going to be really bad and he threw me and he threw my head and he just started going at it and then he actually put a knife inside of my I don't know I don't want to offend any of your listeners um in my groin he told me he was going to cut her out and I thought I was going to die I literally thought I was going to die and then I feel this this burning sensation and I feel wet and I'm like, oh my God. And I have blood pouring out of my leg. I mean, and then I just, out of nowhere, I was like, how about you make love to your wife? Why don't you make love to me? Why don't you, you know, hold me and, and kiss me? And I mean, I, if that man kissed me, I want to vomit. I mean, you know, and then yeah. I'm like, just I mean, what is going on? And then it was like, I took away his power. 
And I had no idea. I was reaching for life straws at that point. I mean, I had no clue. I just, I don't even know where it came from. It was just, you know, forget about all this that just happened. And he's like, stop it, stop it. You know, and he's punching me one side of my face to the other. My face is just back and forth like a tennis match. And then he was like, F this, F that. And he got up and left. He left. He got in his vehicle and he left. And I was like, I don't even know what just happened. Like, I have no idea. That was just insane. He left. And you know what? Bye. You know, I mean, and when he would leave, I've had people say, why didn't you leave? He took my vehicle keys. We didn't have a home line. He took my cell phone. Where am I supposed to go? You know, what am I supposed to do? I am cut, hit, broken, everything you can imagine. What am I supposed to do? This sounds a terrible thing to say, but um, it, it's it's one thing for somebody to beat me up, but for my, if my husband were to beat my unborn child or I would rather go to prison I would at this point I would have I would have put in something in his coffee I would have slipped something in his on his toothbrush or or put a jimmy in his drink and I mean he's got to sleep sometime right I'm not a violent person but that, that's that's what went through my brain was I don't know did any of those thoughts go through your head of course they did of course mm. they did but I don't know if you've ever dealt with anyone on narcotics before um he was on a lot of them uh, because of PTSD and his injuries from being overseas. And so he was on oxycodone and um, Ambien. I can never remember the name of the thing um, to help him sleep. And he would pop his oxycodone like it was a Tums and they didn't phase him. And oh. he would just, he seemed almost like he got more powerful. And when he would get on them, because he got so much more angry. And he would take those and then take some Ambien and he would get it up. I've never dealt with anyone on Ambien before. I don't know if you've had experience, but like he had illusions and like, oh, yeah. he would get up and say, I got to scrub in. I got to be in surgery in an hour. And I'm like, what is he? What is hallucinating? He about? Yeah. He had hallucinations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I've never been with anyone who'd been on Ambien. You know, I didn't know what he did. <laughs> He, would sleep on, he drove on it like he would get in the vehicle and drive and I, I was just mortified at the fact that this medication did such a horrific reaction and this is what he would do I mean and then he would not remember it the next day I, yeah. I said you know because he one day he came in and he was like why did you turn my blankety blank vehicle around blah 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 and I was like I, I didn't turn it around Okay, I know that we are deep in the weeds in Victoria's story, but I think we will do a part two of our interview because we have a lot to say. She has a lot to say. We talked a long time, and I don't really want to edit out all of the good stuff that she said just to get it to a 60-minute interview. So. I hope that you will return next week to hear the rest of her story. I promise you there will be a happy ending. (laughs) It's worth the wait. So I hope that you have a good week and we will see you back here. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org, where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week.